You're listening to the Beyond My Battle podcast. I'm your host, Martel Catalano. Part intimate, part informative, and wholly designed to support you in your journey, each episode combines personal stories with expert insights to explore the many themes of life with illness or disability. Vulnerability is a major theme we discuss at Beyond My Battle. We know that talking about our health conditions or the conditions of a loved one is a major step towards not just accepting them as our reality, but showing up to life with authenticity and ultimately a greater sense of contentment and happiness. But what about when people take this a step further? Our guests in this episode figured out that they needed to not only open up about, but own their illnesses in order to not just feel better about their diagnosis, but help others cope with their diagnoses too. Amanda, Ziad, and Harper share their experiences of, in so many words, looking their individual diagnoses in the face and turning them into their life's purpose. When we sat down to think about the expert portion of this episode, we were like, well, these people are really experts in what they do. They are the pioneers of taking something not so great and choosing to make it something powerful and altruistic. But we realized the unifying factor of these guests was really their resilience. So our guest in the second half of this episode is Dr. Christina Haylett, who is a clinical psychologist, professor, and public speaker specializing in resilience, and in her own words, owning your flossom. I talked to Dr. Haylett about self-care, how we learn through failing, accepting our feelings of not good enough, and how to change the way we view our stress in order to thrive. My name is Amanda Young. I am the founder and owner of Face to Change. I am a social worker, a mentor, an educator, and a life and a health coach. So I wear many, many hats, all of which I love. But I also have a an illness called trigeminal neuralgia, which is a very rare uh, disorder of the cranial nerve, which is a trigeminal nerve that causes extreme pain in your face. My name is Ziad. Uh, I live in the UK. I was diagnosed with Crohn's disease in 2007. I work as a, a diagnostic radiographer, so um, what that is, is someone that takes x-rays, CT scans, MRI scans, um, and deals with patients in many different settings. I'm Harper Spiro. I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm a business coach and consultant, and I'm also the host of Made Visible podcast. And I was diagnosed with a rare immune deficiency when I was 10 years old called hyper IgE or Job syndrome. The first time that I can remember the excruciating amount of pain was when I was teaching a group fitness class and I was wearing a microphone headset and I thought I was being shocked by the microphone, like there was some short in the microphone. So I took it off and the pain kept continuing. I did go the whole year. So between 2006, 2007, I went the whole year um, experiencing symptoms and not getting a diagnosis until about, I think it was July 2007. Um, So that year was in particularly rough. There was a period of time where for about four months in 2012, I was walking down the street and I was completely out of breath and winded. And I'd get down two blocks of New York City streets and couldn't walk. Or I'd get up two flights of stairs and I'd collapse on my couch and something wasn't right. My social media is called The Grumbling Gut. It all started with one of my friends tagged me in this post where it was, say, 10 things no one knows about you. And one of the last things I said on that post, um, and I was very hesitant about sort of uh, putting it out there, was that I have Crohn's disease. So obviously I just hit post. And then within a couple of weeks, actually, I got so, so many different um, messages on my Instagram from friends and strangers saying, oh, I saw you have uh, Crohn's disease. Can I hear about your experience? And even from my friends, they said, uh, what is Crohn's disease? How did you get it? And general questions like that, as well as other people saying how they have a family member that has Crohn's disease. So Face the Change actually started as a 
campaign, the day I kind of went, you know what, I'm ready to tell the world that this is something that I have, that it's not who I am, but it's something that I have. And I'm going to use this as an opportunity to raise funds for research. In July 2018, I decided to launch a podcast called Made Visible. And the reason I started it is because I realized that there was a lot of content out there around invisible illness and chronic illnesses, but I didn't find content that I really related to. Someone that lives a quote unquote normal life and could run a business, have friends, went to school, live my life. And I found that a lot of content that I found online was very related to people who were in hospitals often, were bed bound and really couldn't function as normally as I did in whatever way that is. And so I decided to launch the content that I wanted to listen to. And so Made Visible is a podcast sharing stories of people living with or affected by invisible illness. So either they're patients, caregivers, doctors, healers, anyone who's had some sort of touch point to invisible illness. And our goal is to make people feel less alone while they're going through the challenges of invisible illness. I really felt there was a lack of awareness of what um, inflammatory bowel disease is, but I also think there's a lack of education on how it can actually impact your life. So the whole intent behind my social media and my YouTube is just to provide the information that not everyone may know about Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis through sort of well-researched information. Because there's a lot of bogus information out there and a lot of people can assume that because they have the disease, they're almost an expert on it. It sounds contradictory, but to some extent that is true. Through their own experiences, they are an expert on what is best for them. But when I say that, it's in terms of generality and providing awareness to the uh, general public. So sharing your experiences is great and it's a great way of uh, raising awareness. But if people in the general public don't understand what that disease is or what it's about, they can assume that your experience is the only experience of that disease, if that makes sense. Interestingly, when I first decided to come out and tell everybody I had it, I thought, oh, I'm going to just do this in a big way, right? And that's where Face the Change sort of was born and bred. But at that time, I was still teaching. And one of the things that someone asked me was sort of about like what it would be like. And, and I very clearly detailed how tough it would be for me emotionally and mentally to not be able to teach anymore and give having to give up what I love to do. And the truth is, is that as a social worker, I had to give up doing social work because of the pain. And then I ended up in fitness with, you know, going back to fitness part-time and realizing that the pain itself was getting worse. And I now don't teach classes anymore because I physically can't. I was the person that was the sort of jaded New Yorker that when people got on elevators on the second floor and didn't walk stairs from the second to the first floor, I huffed like, how dare these people think that it's okay to waste my time, my precious time on the elevator. And then I became that person. Because what they found was that I had a cyst the size of a golf ball in my right lung, and I was on medical leave for two months and had surgery. And after surgery, I really couldn't walk so much while I was recovering. And that was the time where I did take the elevator from the second floor, but you couldn't see anything visible on me. The kind of point I always try to get across to anyone that messages me is that they always say, what should I do? I have this, and this is what I'm going through. And I always say, first off, I'm not a doctor, so it will be really unethical for me to even give medical advice over social media. Um, secondly, I can only give advice based on my experiences. So if, say, for example, you've had stomach cramps, I can only tell you what has worked for me. And I always make that very clear. Everything that I tell you is based on my own personal experiences, but you have to remember that not only is your Crohn's or, or Crohn's disease is different to mine, we all react differently to things. So while I can be taking a certain medication, that same drug hasn't worked for many people. How I look at the work that I do with my clients in life coaching people with chronic illness is that 
the only thing that is really constant for us is change. And there is no way to determine what is going to happen and what what the pain will sort of stop you from doing. But there is always a way to sort of adjust what you really want to do in life to sort of fit what's happening for you physically. There is actual research that says that like, if this is what you really want, and you continually focus on making positive change and saying to yourself, you want the positive change that the neurons in your brain and the pathways start to develop and like open up other pathways in your brain to actually get it done. Mental health is never really anything easy to talk about. Um, and I do think uh, my Crohn's has affected my mental health in terms of when I was growing So I was diagnosed when I was 17. So I was like your normal, healthy 17 year old or appear to be anyway and to be going through all these symptoms and things and seeing the physical change in my body where I was losing so much weight and I became almost uh, see-through you kind of worry what people do think about about what's going on with you and then you always worry about what to do if they challenge you on that it's more so that people don't really understand it because internally is what I'm dealing with things. And I'm typically not in a lot of pain with my condition. I'm trying to create different stories and different narratives and different approaches to living with invisible illness. There are some people who have been on the show who are super all about Eastern medicine. And then there are others that are all about Western medicine and some that take a combined approach. And there's no wrong way. It's all about your special, you know, what works best for you. And so my goal is to really just share these different versions of people's lives and situations. I have had people with similar or same conditions, but their approaches are totally different. What's so interesting is when you look at um, and when you work with people that have chronic conditions, you realize that that positive self-talk is very, very hard because you're getting beat up like physically, emotionally, and mentally all the time, right? And so like how much harder is that talk to have with yourself when you're getting like zapped in your face or when there are systemic issues, like if you have a disability that are saying like, no, you can't have this because we can't accommodate you. There is some form of uh, PTSD involved because chronic illnesses do affect your your mental state and I, I think uh, the title for that blog um, I did was called uh, mental state is uh, more than just a state of mind because that's what it is it's, it's always in your face you can't get rid of it there's nothing you can do about it really and no matter how well you sort of manage your trauma from your past there is always that lingering that, that, that stays behind. People who, you know, had cancer past tense and no longer do, and they just completely shifted their purpose because of that, even though on a day-to-day -day level, they may not be affected by it in a way that we are with our conditions. They're still going through stuff, even if it's just emotional at this point. You can't control what's happening to you, but you can control, you know, how you want to work with what you have. Once you're able to get to that place of acceptance, right, which essentially is not being attached, right, to that, that person you were and being able to embrace the person you are, like that really is the process that gets you to that, that place of gratitude. Like, oh, like, yeah, I'm not that person, but I'm this person. And here's what's so great about this person or this moment. There are two different ways to do things and there is no right or wrong way to do it if you choose to show the more uh, positive side of living with a chronic illness to show someone that you can live a full life then great but if you choose to show the more nitty-gritty side so um, surgery scars and sort of what I, what I call the darker side of the chronic illness of always being in hospital then that's also great as well because that's showing that is so not um, sunshine and rainbows and there are difficult times. So my big thing is for the people who are living with invisible illnesses to feel less alone and to feel like there's someone else out there going through what they're going through. I know personally that I've heard stories from people 
living with different conditions that have nothing to do with the types of symptoms that I'm dealing with. And yet we can relate on so many levels. I, I still think that like, in essence, I am who I always was. I just like, you know, might have to take more naps on the weekends. Getting into radiology, where it really does epitomize the saying of making the invisible visible, because that's essentially what the job is. Someone comes in with a broken bone, you can't see it on the outside, but we we have ways to to make it be shown up on on scans. And I think that's always resonated with me in terms of trying to raise awareness uh, to show that not every disability is visible or that every condition or illness is visible. I was so inspired by all three of our guests that I knew it would be difficult to follow up with their stories. But when we stop to ask ourselves why they have been able to find purpose from their diagnoses, we knew we needed to talk to someone about what makes someone more resilient and more willing to put themselves out there and more able to overcome their obstacles. I think you'll be really blown away by what Dr. Haylett has to say next not only because she has a really unique twist on this, but she also lives with a chronic illness herself. I am Dr. Christina Hallett. I'm a board certified clinical psychologist, associate professor at Bay Path University, and a keynote speaker who loves to talk about stress, burnout, resilience, and this idea of owning your flossom. Living stress smart through radical self-care is something that I know that you talk about frequently. And how do you think self-care relates to resiliency? Like, what do they have in the same? Well, I don't think that we can actually have resilience without self-care. And so maybe that's the starting point. And when I think about self-care, it's well beyond this idea of getting a massage or taking a bubble bath, although I think those things are great and I totally recommend them for all sorts of reasons. But when I think about self-care, it's really about accepting who you are, treating yourself with compassion, being willing to acknowledge that we all have limits and that those change over time. It means saying no to things that are just gonna be too much at any point in time, and also being willing to say yes to things like resting, to asking for and accepting help. So I see it as a really broad concept. And so when I say radical self-care, I'm saying this includes everything from knowing your strengths and being proud of them and being willing to say them out loud, as well as knowing the areas in which you're still trying trying to grow and recognizing that as a human, we all make mistakes and we all have growth areas. And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. Yeah, I love that. And I love how you brought up asking for help. I feel like that's a major thing that we need to talk more about in the chronic illness, rare disease world in general, because there is definitely this sense of, oh, if I ask for help, I'm sharing my flaws or I'm coming off as weak. And we need to embrace that we have to ask for help. So I think part of self-care uh, is not only the asking, but but surrounding yourself with people that you can ask for help from. Would you agree? Oh, completely. Y- you know, something happened this morning that I want to share that's related to this in my head. I went to a yoga class and I started doing yoga about 10 years or so ago. And initially when I was doing yoga, I was really into power yoga and it was all about the physicality and it was push, push, push. And I would see occasionally people using props like blocks and straps. And it was sort of this point of pride, like, oh, I want to be good enough so that I don't need to use that. And this morning I was Uh, in this yoga class. And I had two blocks, a little knee pad, and I was using them throughout my practice. And there's a couple of reasons for that. And one is, and I mentioned this to you off air, but I have fibromyalgia. So one of the things I need to do is really pay attention to the amount of energy that I'm expending at any point in time so that I can be as active and involved in my life as I want. But the other piece about using the blocks is that there's so much more room for me to grow. 
And so this is this additional area of accepting help that I think of and that far be it now from me thinking, oh, that's a sign of not good enough. The blocks are there to help me, to help me be more comfortable with who I am and allowing me to do more, to be more of who I am. And that's just such a turnaround. It really has one of the things that's made a difference in my life. For those of us living with health challenges, uh, whether it's a physical disability or something that causes you severe pain or tiredness, or um, whatever it is, really, some form of limitation, which which in reality, we all have some form of limitation, we get really caught up in in this concept of being limited, or we get wrapped up in the flaw or the weakness. Um, and I know that I speak for a larger population when I say this, um, not for everyone, of course, but we've all at times, maybe early in our diagnosis, felt that feeling of, of shame for, for our limitation. And I really love what you shared on your website about owning your flossum. What, how did you come up with that? And what does it mean to you? So for me, it's the recognition that Every single one of us is, by virtue of being human, flawed and awesome. So we're flossom, both at the same time. And that's really my tagline, because what I want each one of us to do is to recognize all of our strengths and that Every single person has limitations and makes mistakes. That's literally what it means to be a human. So this idea of perfection or not trying things because you won't do it well, those are really important. There's also been a lot of research in the past half dozen years into growth mindset. And one of the things we know from that research is that we learn through failing, And that's really different than sort of how I conceptualized things when I was growing up. I am a mostly recovered, perfectionistic workaholic, (laughs) not always recovered, because sometimes I fall back into that same pattern. But it's so important to be able to understand that the way we're most going to learn something is by making an effort having things, some go well and some not go well, and then learning from it. And that's so valuable in terms of then being able to live our best life or being who we want to be and being able ultimately to really transform ourselves into the kind of people who make a difference in the world. I mean, every single person in the world has something wrong with them, right? And, you know, has something amazing about them too. But we are all going through something. It may be that you need a new medication and it's really causing you some either physical disruption or dis dis ease. And this other person over here may not have a diagnosis at all, but they have been through childhood trauma and they have been through something that has created dis ease in their life. And so we are all going through it. And and just because you have this label of a of a diagnosis does not make you any more broken or weak or flawed than the next person. I'd like to share something that I talk about when I do, because I do a lot of public speaking, as you know. And so there's an example related to growth mindset that I often share with people. And it has to do with babies. Because see, as babies, as infants, start learning to turn over and to crawl, they do not go from crawling to running. There's a whole bunch of steps in between. And typically what happens is that a baby first starts learning to pull itself up and tries to stand and wobbles and falls, plop, right on their butt. And the thing is, when that happens, what adults around that baby do is they go, oh, good for you. Look at you. You tried. That's great. Do it again. And get super excited. And what does the baby do? The baby tries again tries, 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 falls, falls, falls. And we continue to encourage that infant. And then ultimately that child gets a little steadier and begins to take a step. And the reality is that if babies had the capacity to think as we do as adults, the very first time that they fell on their butt, they'd be like, oh, forget it. I'm a loser. That's it. I'm just going to sit here on the floor forever. I'm never going to walk because I failed. I tried. I failed. It's all over for me. And instead, what happens is because babies don't have that capacity, they instinctively know that growth comes through trying, falling, failing, learning and applying it forward. 
And unfortunately, we sort of move out of that as we grow and we begin to think, oh, but I should be able to. And there's no should to any of it. Whatever it is that we're thinking about doing or where we want to go, we've got to take some action and then assess how it went and see, hmm, is this working or not working? Is there something else I could use? Is there perhaps assistance that I could get? Just like the baby holding onto the side of the chair. I'd love for you to talk about what you mean by by stress being positive. I know what you mean, of course, in, in the fact that like we need stress to survive and we all need stress to move out of the way of a oncoming traffic, but you talk about swapping your stress and I would love to hear your insight on that. So the first thing about being stress smart is connected to both the mindset research and growth mindset research that I was just referencing. And it also has to do with some research that's been done by a couple different psychologists. And Dr. Kelly McGonigal, who is a psychologist at Stanford, is one of those people. And one of the things that Dr. McGonigal talks about is how is it that we re- view stress. So when we view stress as negative and we say that stress is something that affects our physical health, our emotional health, our cognition, it has all of these negative ramifications. That also coincides with having all of those negative effects in our body, in our minds, in our emotions. But what she's put forward is that there's another way to look at stress, and it involves three things. The first is that stress increases energy. And if you think about it, we already know that because one of the things that people typically think of when they think, oh, I'm under stress, is this idea of the stress response or the arousal brings about adrenaline and cortisol. So the second thing is that stress increases focus and concentration. Now, That's another one where often we think, oh, God, I'm so stressed, I can't even think. But in reality, you have laser-focused ability to concentrate on the whatever the stressor is. Other things you have less ability to focus on. And the third item is that stress is an indication that whatever the stressor is has meaning for you, in part because if it didn't have meaning, it wouldn't be so stressful. When we take all of those together, when we say, okay, so when I'm under stress, this is a sign that I have more energy, greater focus and concentration, and that it's something that's of meaning to me. That allows us to have our body not experience the same kind of negative effects of stress as when we view stress completely as negative. If we perceive stress to just be this horrible tiresome, burdensome thing, we're going to, of course, react to it as as such and react to it negatively. But if we say, oh, initially when I'm stressed, I get this surge of energy, I get hyper-focused, obviously I'm getting a cue that it means whatever I'm stressed about is significant to me in some way. Um, let me use that to my advantage. And you're saying that's the big difference. So swapping comes down to changing your lenses or flipping your perspective. Yes. So let me tell you about SWAP because that's an acronym that I've created. And when I say SWAP your beliefs, S stands for self-compassion and treating yourself the way that you would someone that you care about. W stands for worthiness and recognizing that simply because you're a human being, you're worthy, that every human being is worthy of love, care, and compassion. A stands for ask for and accept help. And then P is for positive self-talk. So those are the action steps to me that go with. So we have the mindset. And then what are these additional action steps that we can take to really swap or begin to change our beliefs and behave in this, what I'm calling, stress-smart manner? I know that there's so many people who are channeling their diagnosis into something really meaningful and really helpful for others, but also are totally susceptible to getting caught in the stress cycle, which is very toxic at the end of the day. I mean, there is that initial urge, you know, surge, I should say, of of energy and focus. But over the long term, we know that chronic stress has health consequences. So I wonder what you can encourage people in that position to to do with their stress or how to reframe or swap their stress? What's like a, an action step? It is absolutely true that 
chronic stress is highly problematic. And that's partly why I say one of the first steps you can do is to begin to change how you're looking at stress in general, right? Begin to look at mindset. Secondly, one of the things I think that we have to look at is how harsh are we being to ourselves? To what degree are we setting unreasonable expectations? To what degree are we isolating from other people? To what degree are we really engaging in uh, some very negative self-talk regarding situations? Those kinds of things can all make a huge difference. When I think about what are the building blocks for everything, and I have this concept I'm sort of working about that has to do with like the house of radical self-care, but if I think of that house of radical self-care, the foundation is based on eat well, sleep well, move your body, and breathe. And we hear those things all the time, and people just are so dismissive. They're like, yeah, 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 I know. Eat well, sleep well, move your body, breathe. And you know, often what we get in response is, well, I'm too tired to move my body, or I'm in too much pain, or I don't have the money to eat well, or I can't stop worrying, which is why I can't sleep. So each one of those are areas that we need to address to the extent that we can, given the resources that we have. And that doesn't mean that there, we're necessarily doing everything perfectly, because there's no such thing, but instead recognizing and starting at any one of those places. What I think we can also do, and that for me, one of the most foundational pieces, and this idea of breathing. If there's anything that anybody rolls their eyes and looks at me most commonly for, it's breathing. And everyone, what I get all the time is like, oh, whatever, breathing doesn't work for me, blah, blah, blah. And there's very clear neurophysiology to this. So my next response is, with all due respect, if breathing isn't working for you, you are clearly not doing it properly and not practicing. Because from a physiological perspective, it absolutely reduces arousal. But the key being, of course, that we need to take in those slower, deeper breaths from deep in our belly and then let them out slowly. Right? And there's different breathing strategies. There's some videos that I have about this on my YouTube channel, all sorts of different ways that people can practice breathing. But the bottom line is, if you're not doing deeper belly breathing, what you're going to do, if you're breathing shallowly from up in the sort of top of your chest, you're literally increasing your arousal. You're increasing the stress response automatically. So when people say, no, I try to breathe and I get more stressed, I'm like, that's because you're taking a more shallow breath. That's from a physiological perspective, exactly what's happening. Like you're now turbocharging your stress instead of reducing it. And so breathing is the place where I think if we begin to practice just one or two slower, deeper breaths, that can give us a little bit of space to be able to think a little more clearly and to then begin to let go of some of the judgment and then decide which of those other areas might be one we feel we can tackle. Do we think we can do something about when we eat or how we eat or what we eat? Or do we think we can, are we willing to try to go to bed 15 minutes earlier? Or like in my case, one of the things for me about fibromyalgia is that if I'm going, going, going and not monitoring, I can suddenly hit the wall and literally be virtually unable to move. And it's definitely happened where I've been out somewhere and I'm like, oh God, I don't know how I'm going to get home. Like I I don't have the energy to move my body enough to get in my car and drive home. So again, like looking at sleep in terms of rest or taking care of one's body, what we need to do. And then this idea of moving, which does not mean that people need to go to the gym for an hour and a half every day, right? Moving could be that you're literally adding in 20 extra steps because you're parking four spaces further away, right? Or you're trying to do some gentle stretching. And the reason that, for example, that movement is so important is that when we begin to move, one of the things that we do is that we begin to strengthen and support some of the neurotransmitters that are working in our brain that help us to be more positive, to not have as much of a stress response, and increase the growth of uh, additional brain cells, which helps us learn new things better. What is either the 
this maybe like a common thread that you notice for this community building resilience or overcoming some attribute or some negative self-talk or limiting belief? What is a common thread that maybe you see as a challenge and also and or that advice that you would give this group as a whole, given that common thread? What I see is that people feel that they're defective and not good enough. And that's literally across the board. Now, I would also say that I believe it's a part of what the vast majority of us go through. I, personally, I think everybody, but you know, <laughs> since nothing is absolute, maybe not absolutely everybody, is this idea of not good enough. But when someone is struggling with a chronic illness, whether that's visible or not visible, and I guess I might say even more so when it's not visible, there's so much this sense of there's something wrong with me. And by definition, when someone has a medical diagnosis, because we work in this medical model, medical diagnosis means wrong. It means out of the norm, it, right? That, so that's already there. The, the person is not inaccurate to say, mm -hmm. wow, I, oh, there's really something wrong with me. But if we stay in that place, that medical diagnosis equaling wrong, equaling defective, equaling not good enough, that's really problematic. And so one of the things that I really work with people on is this idea of beginning to truly practice the ideas of acceptance, forgiveness, and moving towards self-love. And I would say that for me, uh, I very much believe that self-love is a process, not a destination, because there's always going to be something that comes up that has you questioning yourself. And I did a TED Talk on this. Um, it's literally about sort of how do we redefine self-love and redesign it, because we have this idea like you're either you either love yourself or you don't and if you don't that's what goes along with this whole i'm defective kind of thing um, so this idea of how can i begin to treat myself differently how can i begin to see myself as a member of the human race and as you also said earlier because everyone has challenges and struggles we don't necessarily see them and we don't necessarily know them but they're there that's part of what it means to live day by day. And the so stopping comparisons becomes an important action step. Mm, definitely. Right? And then the next piece, because that's still going to happen. So, you, so I say to people, recognize, notice when you're making those comparisons, take a breath or two, and then imagine that somebody that you really care for and love was saying to themselves that same negative comparison or negative self-talk that you were saying and think about how you would respond to them. Because when someone that we care starts saying, oh, I'm such a jerk, I'm a loser, blah, 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 everyone else is better than me, we care about them. So we say, no, that's not true, or you have strengths, or we Right? We give them a very different kind of response. So notice that it's happening. Take a couple breaths. Imagine what you would say to somebody that you really care about. And then take those thoughts and apply them back to yourself. And that's how you begin this process of acting in a self-compassionate manner that leads you closer to self-acceptance and then the process of self-love. Dr. Halet and our other guests talked about the importance of self-care in order to be our best selves. If you haven't already explored our emotional e-toolkit, it's filled with tools like breathwork videos, journaling exercises, and meditations that reduce stress and build self-compassion. You can find the emotional e-toolkit and all its tools under the resources section of beyondmybattle.org. This show is presented by Beyond My Battle, a nonprofit helping people manage the stress of illness and disability. All of the organization's resources, like this podcast, are rooted in mindfulness, awareness, and compassion to help individuals and care partners live happier, healthier, and more resilient lives. 
To support the podcast or any of our other programs, visit beyondmybattle.org backslash donate. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe, rate, review, and share with your family and friends. 